Hello, everybody. What is circumstantial evidence? That's today's topic in today's video. What is circumstantial evidence? And now we're going to play around with this ticker. And now on the other side, we're going to see what is today's evidence. No, not what's today's evidence. What is circumstantial evidence as I explain some great information to you in just a moment. So stand by as we get other people on here. Come join us as we show them some great information because what are we going to talk about today? What is circumstantial evidence? So now we have my fancy ticker tape that you know is better than any 3D graphic you're going to see on any TV show, whether it's Fox News, whether it's CNN, whether it's CNBC, or any of the other stations. This is better. This is creative. This is, this is grassroots stuff, right? Print it out on a piece of paper. What is circumstantial evidence? Owen, how are you? This is the basic of basics, but it is better. My ticker tape is so corny, but it is so much better than any 3D graphic you can ever see on any news station or TV show. Why? Because it's so simple, okay? You have the topic, print it out, put it on a piece of paper, and stand by while we get more people to come and join us. But at least you know what today's topic is going to be. What is circumstantial evidence? So give me a few moments as we get more people to come in. And now we're going to get started talking about what? What is circumstantial evidence? All right, so we're ready to get started. Hi, everybody. I'm Jerry Oginski. I'm a New York medical malpractice and personal injury attorney. And you already know what today's topic is. It is... What is circumstantial evidence? So let me give you a great example so that you can clearly understand immediately what circumstantial evidence is. And by the way, you should know, this applies in every type of civil lawsuit. It applies in every type of criminal lawsuit. But mostly I'm talking about, hey, Robert, nice to see you. Uh, I'm talking about civil cases as they apply here in New York. And you're going to see very quickly that this is going to be very applicable to every type of TV drama that you see. It's applicable to every type of uh, courtroom drama that you see in the movies because you will hear over and over again that things, that cases are based on circumstantial evidence, right? Somebody was convicted because of what? Circumstantial evidence. That's right. What is circumstantial evidence? It's a series of facts that are put together where we don't have an entire sequence. We weren't there. We don't have a video of exactly what occurred. So we have pieces of information with gaps that are missing. Imagine that. You have a sequence, you have a story, you have a series of events that occurred, and now you have a result. And in the types of cases that I'm familiar with, I'm talking about cases where people get hurt, whether it's because of a careless driver or maybe a careless doctor or a hospital staff. So now we know that somebody suffered injury. And now we see, let me, let me go back to the example I want to share with you. Let's say you're driving down the highway. And all of a sudden, you see on the side of a road a car on the, in a ditch on the side of the roadway. And you see smoke coming out of the engine bay. And you see the front of the car crashed in, all crumpled up. And as you're passing by, you take a look, and you see the driver suffered massive trauma, bleeding from all parts of his head. And now the, his head is resting against the deployed airbag. Those are the facts that we know to be true. OK, so now you're looking around. And you make a number of assumptions and conclusions just based upon the information you just saw. Remember, you came upon this incident. You didn't see how this incident occurred. You didn't see what caused this car to go into the ditch, right? You didn't see what caused the airbag to deploy. You didn't see why this driver suffered such massive trauma. So now your brain is trying to put into the gaps exactly how this car came to be on the side of the road. Well, let's take a look at the facts as you know them to be true based upon your observations. First, we know that when driving, cars typically don't wind up in a ditch unless there's a problem, right? Unless there may have been an accident, unless there may have been a mechanical failure with a car or with a tire, right? There had to be some intervening cause to contribute to this car winding up in a ditch. And now, you also see that the driver suffered significant injury. We also know, our common sense tells us, that, listen, people don't just happen to suffer massive trauma for absolutely no reason. That's a significant point. So these are facts that we know them to be true. And now our brain is trying to scramble to explain 
how this person came to be on the side of the road, how this person, uh, how the airbag, air, airbag came to be deployed, and now um, what else do they need to know? What do you need to know? You need to know that the other fact that you know to be true, that listen, there has to be some reason to explain why this car is crumpled up. Also, the smoke emanating from the engine bay, that suggests something else to you, doesn't it? It suggests that this may have occurred extremely recently, maybe seconds before, maybe moments before you approach this car. You don't know. So now you start to look around. You start to look around to see if there's another car that may have caused or contributed to this accident. And you don't see any, or at least not right away. Okay? You also are looking around as you're driving, as the, as, as the cars are rubbernecking by, and you see skid marks right, for about 20 feet before the car reached the ditch. And that's a fact that you have observed. So these are facts that you know to be true based upon your own observation. But your mind is trying to figure out, how did this happen? So what do we know? The facts, the direct evidence that we have in this example are, number one, the car is in the ditch. Number two, there's smoke coming out of the engine bay. Number three, the airbag is deployed. Number four, yeah, there we go, four, the driver of the car suffered massive trauma and is bleeding all over their head. Those are the facts. Now, where's the circumstances? Where's the circumstantial evidence? Well, those are the circumstance, that, that is the circumstantial evidence. Now, let's say we are bringing a lawsuit on behalf of this injured driver, and we are trying to claim that someone else caused or contributed to this injury, to his problem, to this accident. Now, we are trying to show to the jury that they have to reach certain conclusions based upon the facts that we know them to be true. But there are gaps. We don't know what the driver was doing. Maybe the driver was texting. We don't know if there was a blowout of a tire. We don't know if there was a brake failure. We don't know if there was a steering mechanism failure. There's so many things that we don't know and our initial assumptions and conclusions may be wrong. Why? Because this topic is all about circumstantial evidence. So we have certain pieces of evidence, but we don't have all the necessary evidence. We don't have a sequence. We don't have a timeline yet, nor do we have video, nor do we have any witnesses to go ahead and explain exactly what was done and why. So because of that, now we have to rely on circumstantial evidence. And because of that, now we have to, as the attorney, we have to go ahead and try and get the uh, jury when the case goes to trial we have to get them to recognize that they have to reach certain conclusions or assumptions based upon the missing gaps. You see, our brain, Joseph, you can come by. I'm live. Just walk right through. Um, we have to get the jury to recognize that there are certain pieces of information that they have to piece the dots together. And if they don't piece them together, they're going to be left wondering, how did this happen? Why did this happen? So that's really important. So one of the things that we would suggest is, hey, listen, there's only one explanation. Actually, there are multiple explanations. There's only one explanation for this accident. An accident does not happen by itself. The only reason why this accident happened is because of someone else's carelessness. And now we have to try and show who else caused or contributed to this incident. But the point is, without having direct evidence, without having the ability to show exactly what happened, having live video to show exactly where they were, what they were doing, what happened to them, how a bird happened to come down, hit the front windshield, this person lost control, or maybe, maybe it was a bee that flew in through the window, and now they're getting all hysterical because they have an allergy to bees, and now they lose control. Next thing you know, they're in the ditch, caused an accident happened, and now they suffered significant injury. We don't know that. And there have been movies and, and uh, stories about that type of scenario to explain how circumstantial evidence may not be as accurate or as conclusive as we think they are based upon our own knowledge, our own experience, and our own observations. So what else do we need to show? Let me give you another example that will help you understand what circumstantial evidence is. All right, we have a cat in addition to a dog, but we have a cat that's an indoor-outdoor cat. He's a beautiful, beautiful black cat, and he likes to spend a lot of time outdoors. So one day, the family comes home, and as we're walking up the path, we notice two things. We notice that there is feathers, white feathers, all over the front uh, steps by our front door. And now, 
A few moments later, our cat walks up the pathway. This is a beautiful black cat. And what do we notice about the cat? He's got white feathers all in his black fur. So what conclusions can we immediately reach as a result of those observations? All right, so let's look at the question. The question is, what facts do we know to be true based upon what our knowledge and common sense are, is, are, are? What, what do we know to be true? Well, we know that white feathers typically don't show up as if they've exploded all over our front step. That's number one. Number two, feathers, white feathers, typically are not present on my cat unless he's done something he shouldn't have done. Well, my cat has been known to try and attack. Hey, Robert, nice to see you. Thanks for joining. Um, our cat has been known to go after, to pounce, and to go after and hunt for birds. And he's been pretty successful. And what he does is he takes that bird and then he leaves it right at our doorstep as a present. Isn't that nice? Thanks so much, Robert. I appreciate it, saying great stuff. Uh, so he leaves that for us as a present. Now, that's very nice of him, but we are left with the job of cleaning that stuff up, which is not so pleasant. But here's the point. We know that the cat will sometimes go after and try and kill a bird. In the absence of our cat doing that, there's no other rational or reasonable explanation to figure out why our cat would have white feathers all over his face and all over his body. None. Unless, of course, the bird had white feathers and he was successful. He caught it, and now he killed the bird, and now he's got it all over himself. And now he, either in the course of bringing it to the front door or picking away at it or trying to eat it, whatever it is, now he left the feathers all over the front step. That's a simple explanation. But here's the dilemma. The dilemma is we weren't there. We didn't see it happen. We don't know exactly what occurred. All we know is we walked on the front step. There's no blood on our front step. But there is what looks to be like an explosion of feathers. And now, what do we know? We know from our experience that feathers simply just don't show up on our front step. Exactly right. Thank you. That's exactly right. So the point is, hey, Kimberly, nice to see you. Today we're talking about, hang on. Today I'm talking about what is circumstantial evidence, right? And I'm going through a, an example of what circumstantial evidence is. And this applies to both civil cases, to criminal cases, and you'll see it occur in TV dramas, in movies, and if you go into court, you'll see it happen in real-life cases. And for the cases that I'm familiar with, the ones involving accident matters, medical malpractice, and wrongful death matters, circumstantial evidence comes up often. And many times we can prove a case showing that we are more likely right than wrong, that uh, we are entitled to a verdict in our favor based upon circumstantial evidence. So let me get back to the example I was talking about. The example was, so we have a cat, an indoor-outdoor cat. He's a beautiful black cat. And one day we come home and we see white feathers all over the front step. And a few moments later, we see our cat walking down the path and he's got white feathers all over his face as if he had just dug into some pie or something and had feathers in it. And the question is, what happened here? What conclusions and observations, what conclusions can we draw based upon the observations we've just made? So as part of this example, as part of this exercise, let's look at what the facts are that we know to be true. We know that feathers typically do not just show up at our doorstep for absolutely no reason. We also know that feathers don't, white feathers don't show up in my cat's black fur for no reason whatsoever. Here's another fact that we know to be true. Our cat is an indoor-outdoor cat, and he will occasionally go after and try and kill a bird. He'll stalk the bird, and then he'll pounce on it and try and kill it. And many times he's been successful doing that, and he will bring that bird to our front doorstep and leave it for us as a present. So we know those facts to be true. So what conclusions can we draw based upon the set of facts that we know, even though we did not see him kill the cat, even though we did not see where the bird is, right? All we saw are feathers. We didn't see the bird at all. We looked and couldn't find it. So what do we know? Well, here are the conclusions that we can reach. We, the obvious one is, yes, he found a bird, a bird with white feathers. He now killed it. And now he dragged it and pulled it over to the front step, and maybe he tore it apart, maybe he tried to eat it. I don't know what it was, but the point is, what conclusions can we reach based upon the circumstantial evidence, different pieces of information with gaps, to tell us and explain to us how this situation came to be? If our mind automatically fills in the gaps based upon our knowledge of how things work, 
now we connect the dots, even though there are gaps in what is missing, and we didn't actually see this take place, now our brain says, okay, this is a logical progression of what happened. He must have seen a bird, now he went after the bird, he caught the bird, he dragged the bird to the front step, and then he started picking it apart. That's the logical sequence of events. There could be other explanations, though. We don't have a good explanation other than that one, but that's why you'll see that in cases involving circumstantial evidence, attorneys can use the circumstantial evidence to show the facts to the jury as we know them, and then use witnesses to try and fill in the gaps, and then suggest to the jury how they should conclude those facts and fill in the blanks of what the timeline, the timeline sequence was. Hang on, we're going to take an unsponsored water break so I can actually say what I want to say. Okay. So, we try and get the jury to recognize that yes, there are gaps in the sequence of events, and here's the only logical conclusion that you can reach as a result of this circumstantial evidence. So, Robert, thank you so much. My wife destroyed my favorite down pillow. Whoa, that's a good one, but one I'm not going there with. I'm not going to accuse her of that unless I definitely uh, have evidence of that and have video of that because I don't want to suffer the repercussions that I know will happen if I make such an accusation on the doorstep, no less. Thank you. That's great. Um, so that is, see that? That is another logical explanation. It may not be a likely one, but it is a logical explanation, especially if I didn't like those down pillows, or maybe my wife didn't like those pillows. And by the way, I don't like the pillows that she has for us on the bed. So maybe one day that'll happen, and we'll come home and we'll see all those white feathers down the steps. Um, but that's exactly the point. So when I talked about the car accident scenario, where now you're coming upon a scene, you see a car in the ditch, you see the airbag deployed, you see the front of the car smashed in, you see smoke coming out of the front of the engine, and now you're trying to identify how did this car get to be in this position? You use your common sense, you use your knowledge and understanding of how things work to try and piece together exactly how this car came to be. How did this incident come to happen? And now you want an explanation. You want to find some reason to go ahead and lead you to that conclusion. And even though there can be competing conclusions, one may be right, one may be wrong, there may be more than one explanation in order to lead you to the correct conclusion. So why do I share this quick information with you? I share it with you just to give you an insight and an understanding and to pull a disappearing trick while I picked up my fancy piece of paper talking about what is circumstantial evidence today, right? I wanted to share this great information with you to let you know how these types of cases work and really what is circumstantial evidence and how it applies in civil cases and how it applies in matters that you deal with every day and things that you think about or see on TV or in the movies. You know, I realize you're watching this because it came up in your Facebook feed and hopefully you found this interesting and educational. And if you did, I encourage you to share this information with your friends so that they can learn about it too. And by the way, if you're watching this on replay or have questions about your matter that happened here in New York concerning circumstantial evidence, there we go, then what I encourage you to do is pick up the phone and call me. I can answer your legal questions. You know I answer questions like yours every single day and I'd love to chat with you. You can reach me at 516-487-8207 or by email at jerry, G-E-R-R-Y, at oginski-law.com. Well, that's it for today's video about what is circumstantial evidence. I'm Jerry Oginski. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye.